Hello, happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome to Sabbath School. If you hear a little bit of water running in the background, please ignore it. We're going to be having five baptisms this week, and we're very excited to fill our baptistry. So uh, let's get started. Mark, would you like to pray? I will. Um, <clears throat> dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity for us to come together, dig into your word. We're going to learn about the cost of rest. We're going to learn about David and his troubles and how he ultimately overcomes. Um, please be with us as we study this lesson and each of us as we present it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so our memory verse text is from Psalms 51.10, which says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is a really important text. In fact, this is a text we almost need to pray every day, or at least regularly, because all of us can have our hearts created into God's heart, and that we always daily want His Spirit within us. So when we look at our lesson, it talks about peace and how many people are desperate to find peace and quiet. They're willing to pay for it even. Now, People go on retreats from the big cities. Uh, I know that when, I have to laugh because when our, our kids go on some of these mission trips or these weekend retreats, they put them on an internet free fast. <laughs> and and their, um, all of their, their phones and all of their devices. So, um, and so people are just even willing to pay to sit quietly and um, think or nap or meditate or whatever. They wear re uh, noise-reducing, the earphones that, that people will wear so they, they can, don't have to hear noise. And so I know that when I need rest, I do like to shut out the world or go to the beach or find a quiet place where I'm without a lot of distractions or demands on my time and my life. And I'm sure all of you can relate to that. So those who take Christ at his word surrender their souls to his keeping. Their lives to ordering will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad in his presence. We see here, we see that Christ is, is the center of this. I had someone that I was doing Bible studies with this week was having all kinds of things going on in their lives. And they said, you know, but I have peace. I just, I just feel peace with all this crashing down around me. And we know that Christ can do that, that peace in the storm. And we've, <clears throat> we've seen that um, in others and in our own lives. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. The Lord says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Our lives may seem a tangle, but as we commit ourselves to the wise master worker, he will bring out a pattern of life and character that will go, that will be to his own glory. And that character will express the glory, character of Christ, and will be received into the paradise of God. A renovated race shall walk with him in white, for they are worthy. So we get that, we see that from Desire of Ages, page 331. So <clears throat> this week's lesson focuses on one of the saddest chapters in David's life. The king of Israel abused his God-given authority and led the wife of one of his soldiers into sin. Uriah was a warrior in David's army fighting in a battle for his king. David took advantage of his absence. When Bathsheba became pregnant because of David's lustful adultery, the king tried to cover up his sin. <clears throat> and he really, I mean, he went to great lengths to cover up his sin, and we're going to read about that. Uriah revealed his sterling character when he refused to enter the house while his army was fighting. When David's initial plan didn't work, 
he urged Joab, the captain of the king, to place Uriah in front of the battle so he would face certain death. David's lustful look led to a lustful act, which led to a deceptive plot to kill an innocent man. The devil's temptations are designed to meet each one of us at our weakest point. And believe me, Satan knows our weak spots. He spent many thousands of years reading people, and he does it, and he, he looks for our weakest points. David recognized his guilt, and I think we're going to talk about this in depth, but this is a, this is a key point in this story. He recognized his guilt through a parable that was told him by Nathan the prophet. Brokenhearted, the king made an agonizing confession. His repentance was deep, genuine, and heartfelt. Psalms 51 is an earnest plea for forgiveness and a changed heart. God answered David's prayer. And that's why when we fall, that memory verse, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, is exactly what we need to have happen. He was forgiven, but forgiveness does not result in avoiding tragic consequences of sin. In one way or another, through this, his life, David experienced the terrible consequence of his sinful act. As a forgiven child of God, he entered <coughs> into heaven's rest, but still experienced the anguish of the sinful act. So we're going to think about some key points today. I, wanna, I want us to think about this that revolve around um, King David and his sin. First of all, in Acts, and this was after David died, God said, and we see this um, in Acts 13, 22, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And so as we look at this story of, of King David today, we need to see that he was willing to do all of God's will. Oftentimes with sin, we think that our sins just affect us. But they don't, and we're going to see that. The consequences of sin does not just affect us as the sinner, but it affects those we come in contact with as well. David's willingness to repent when his sin was pointed out, he made no excuses. Now, I know if you're like me, I like to make excuses for most things when I'm not right. And so we see a completely different attitude in David, no excuses. And he willingly accepted God's judgment. So um, when things don't quite go our way and we have to deal with the results of our sinful acts, do we complain about them? Or do we know that God knows what's best for us and accepts his judgment? And five, he did not allow his sin and the results stand in the way of his continued relationship with God. Sometimes we get mad and walk away from God. I've experienced that in my life as well. So think about this. David, he took it, he, he trusted God, and he continued his relationship with God. So I pray that this week that we're encouraged by this lesson as we see how God worked in David's life and how David responded to God. All right. So day, Sunday's lesson is worn and weary. So Scott, tell us about... King David and worn and weary. Okay, thank you, Barbara. So, in worn and weary, this kind of introduces the story of what happened with uh, David's sin with Bathsheba. So, it says, um, on a balmy spring evening, restless King David paced on the roof of his palace. He should have been with his army on the other side of the Jordan, he should have been leading God's people to defeat the Ammonites and finally bring peace to the kingdom. So in this case, David, instead of um, resting the way that God would have wanted him to rest, he decided to take his own rest, which ended up causing him unrest. So 
Um, let's read from the Bible kind of what happened. This is from Second Samuel chapter 11. Then it happened in the spring at the time when the kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they brought destructions on the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. Now at the evening time, David got up from his bed and walked around the roof uh, on the king's house, and on the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent servants and inquired about the woman. Someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and had her brought, and when she came to him, she, he slept with her, and when she purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. But the woman conceived so that she sent word and informed David, I am pregnant. Okay, so now the, the rest of this part is basically how David tries to get himself out of trouble instead of falling back to God and confessing in sin and having God get him out of trouble. So let's see what happened with the rest of the story. Um, it said, Now David sent word to Joab, said, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab, Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to David, David asked about Joab's well-being and that of the people and the condition of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the king's house and a gift from the king and was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go to his own house. Now when they informed David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey why do you not go down to your house? And then Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lords are camping in the open field. Should I then go to my house and eat and drink and sleep with my wife? By your life and by the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today also, and tomorrow you, I will let you go back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day um, and the day after. Now David summoned Uriah, and he ate in his presence, and he made Uriah drunk. In the evening Uriah went to lie on his bed with his Lord's servants, but he still did not go down to his house. Uh, so then, I guess David tried... Uh, one way of covering up his sin, and since that didn't work, um, he decided to send a letter to Joab saying, uh, Station Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and pull back from him so that he may be struck and killed. So it was uh, Joab kept watch on the city that he stationed Uriah at the place where he knew the, were the valiant men. And the men of the city went out and fought against Joab, and some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent a messenger, reported to David all the events of the war. He ordered the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, then it shall be that if the king's wrath rises against you, why did you move against the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of uh, Jerubbesheth? Did a woman not throw an upper millstone on him from the wall that he died at Thebes? Why did you move against the wall? Then you should say, uh, your servant Uriah the Hittite also died. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David everything that Joab had said to him. And the messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, but we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Anyway, so I'll, I'll just summarize from here. Um, so essentially, David, who had been a perfect king up to this time, caring about the, the unfortunate, about the people who couldn't defend themselves, 
became an oppressive tyrant because he was trying to cover up his own sins. So he was willing to commit murder just so that he would maintain his own honor and not let this information out. But as we shall see, this, this definitely had consequences to where he was no longer able to feel at rest. We'll go on to Monday. Okay. All right, Mark. Yep. Okay. So, wake up call. And we're going to talk about that, which we're going to talk about the prophet Nathan, which Barbara touched on. And then we're going to talk about David. And first thing I read about um, this part of our lesson is that the prophet Nathan had a hard job to do. Um, God sent him to tell King David he was an evil man. And if you know, you're trying to confront a king and saying that you're evil, um, some bad things could happen. So even with us personally, if some of us are brothers and sisters and parents and elders, co-workers, we may also have to confront someone who's sinned or done something wrong. So let's read, as we read this section about what Prophet Nathan did, let's read about what we can learn um, what prophet, on how to approach someone who has sinned in David's wake-up call. So we're going to start with 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And if it's not up there, I will go ahead and read it. Here, yeah, it is. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There are two men in one city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished and grew up together with him with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay with his in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepare it for the man who had come to him. Amazingly, Nathan first comes to David and doesn't start with an accusation. Often if we, are, if we need to come to someone for a particular purpose, one of the things you might want to do is often we, we run into this thing that maybe we're, we're going to go ahead and confront them right away. Nathan didn't do that. In fact, let's see, as he says, instead he says a story, and let's read in Samuel 5 and 6 what David's response to this was. So it's 2 Samuel 12, verses 5 and 6. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, and the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Wow, David realizes, Nathan told the story, realizes that this story, this man is, is really bad. He has to pay back Four times what he gave. That actually comes from Leviticus, one of the rules of, uh, you know, if, you, if some, you've taken someone's lamb from you. Yeah. And the other thing I was thinking about as you were telling the story is how um, King David had been in situations where people had taken from him yeah. as he was going to war. I remember his, his wife, Abigail, and how it came to be that he ended up with her. This man wouldn't, wouldn't share food with David or his, yeah. his army. So this was a very personal kind of example for David. And probably an example, and we're going to talk about it, it was something that Nathan had to know because he knew him. And we're going to dig at the end about one of the lessons that uh, Prophet Daniel had. So obviously, what is, what is now the Prophet Nathan tells David like it is in Samuel 12, 2, 2 Samuel verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 7 through 14. So let's see what... Here, here's the big, the big uh, shebang, chapter, uh, verses 7. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man, the man that, you know, this, this, this man, the same, the rich man. Thus says the Lord of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wife into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. 
So Nathan had to do, first of all, he tells a story, and obviously now he tells David the solution. But he started with a story. And as Barbara said, it was a story that was personal to David. If we're going to have to confront someone who's done something wrong, that's probably one of the first lessons we do. We need to know them. They need, as our brother and sister, what makes them tick? How do we approach them? And Ephesians, I, this reminds me of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 and 32, of a way to approach them when thinking about the right way to do this. And let's, we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 to 32. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, but all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And I think that, you know, to me, Nathan must have done that in a tone of voice that was caring, even though he, he was, hey, this is the matter of fact, he must have done it in a way of toning. The other thing we need to know and is that beforehand, and I, it's not written in the text, but I'm going to say this, that Nathan must have prayed to God before he went to see David. He must have prayed. Um, this was going to be, either way you do it, when you go up a king and tell him you're evil, you, there, it's serious consequences could happen. How to do this right. And, you know, often when we are, if we're telling someone, some, most of the time, or it can be times where someone has made grievances to us, and we're confronting them about that. And this reminds me of the Lord's Prayer, and we'll read that again because I think it's a good Lord's Prayer. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 8 through 15, and it goes as this. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts and forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For your kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in 14 it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The prophet Daniel must have prayed heavily before admonishing the king. The other thing I want to say about this thing, that's part of, that's prophet Nathan. Um, and I, I keep saying Nathaniel, but it, Prophet Nathan. But in, the other thing we want to do is what was David's response right away when he heard this story? And amazingly, let's read about it in 2 Samuel verses, chapter 12, verses 13. He says, David says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Two things that strike me. After all the story that uh, Scott gave about how uh, David really worked really hard to cover up this sin, here he makes no excuses. He says, yes, I have sinned. I've sinned against the Lord. And another neat thing about it is Im immediately the prophet Nathan, through God, said, I forgive you. It's pretty amazing. I mean, God will forgive you immediately. Trust with how Saul responded when Samuel confronted him with having saved the best of the cattle and sheep mm. from uh, mm. the city he was supposed to have destroyed completely. And so, if I remember correctly, Saul offered excuses for why he didn't do well. The people wanted to save the best cattle. <laughs> yeah. There was no excuses at all. David did not give excuse. He immediately admitted his fault. And I'm going to say that David had the law. He knew his sin. Okay, it was horrible. David st still didn't admit it. And of course, he, God had to come to him and, and then he had to admit it. But I'll tell you one thing that, that strikes me is that David knew he had sinned, but he brought Nathan into his room. He brought them to the castle. He could have pushed Nathan away, but he didn't. He kept God close. He kept the law close. If we sin, one of the things I see in reading this text is even in this case, David kept the law and kept the God and that mirror of the law close. The other thing I want to point out, and I know I'm going a little over, but I'll, I'll catch up later, okay, is that David, when he realized that, that um, he had sinned, he said, I didn't sin against 
Bathsheba and Uriah. Of course he did, but he said, I sin against the Lord. In Psalms 51 verses 4, it says it very clearly. This is talking about the same, same event we read in Jeremiah. Against you only, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So David knew that, you know, any sin that we do, it's really ultimately against God. I mean, it's going to be against others and affects others, as Barbara said earlier in the, in the, in the, at the beginning, but it will also ultimately be against God. Ellen White finishes us up nicely in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 722. The prophet's rebuke touched the heart of David. Conscious was aroused. His guilt appeared in all its enormity. His soul was bowed in penitence before God. With trembling lips, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. All wrong done to others reaches back to the injured one, from the injured one to God. David had committed a grievous sin towards both Uriah and Bathsheba. He keenly felt this, but infinitely greater was his sin against God. Whether we are the ones that must talk to a brother and sister or a son or daughter about sin, we must do it with God in our heart. We must pray. And when we sin, we need to know we sin against the Lord. Admit your sin as David did and be forgiven right away, but center your heart and your mind towards Jesus. Okay, that's, that's Monday for us. Thank you. All right. I'm going to pick up a little bit where you left off, Mark, and we're going to move on a little bit more in David um, uh, with, with this story. And our <clears throat> text starts here at verse 10 uh, in 2 Samuel. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me. You have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives bef from before you and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of his, this son. For you did secretly, but I will do these things in Israel before the son. So <clears throat> David said to Nathan, I have sinned. So David completely, as Mark said, repented. But as we look at this, we need to keep going on. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child who is born to you will surely die. Now, I can't imagine how devastated David was when he realized that because of his sin, he was going to lose a child. And because of his sin, David never had peace in his house. And if we look at this, when Nathan confronted him about the enormity of sin, he was, he was completely broken. And he confessed, and immediately Nathan assured him. But we also see that there was consequence to David's sin. We know that his firstborn did die. And we know, and we're going to read about that a little bit more in just a minute. But then we also see in 2 Samuel that Amnon took his sister. And, and we see that in 2 Samuel 13. And it caused so much anger that Absalom killed his brother two years later. So they, there was never any real peace in that family. And then Absalom completely went against King David. In 2 Samuel 16, 22, it says, So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and Absalom went to his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. I mean, this was really humiliating for King David to have his son do something like this. Um, and so we see that even though he was forgiven, there was a lot of discord that went on because of his sin. So let's keep reading in um, uh, verse 15. Then Nathanael departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife born to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of the house arose and went to him, trying to raise him up from the ground. 
but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. So David was devastated. Can you imagine feeling that much pain where you're laying prostrate on the ground begging God? Um, That's a really hard place to be with that much grief. Um, So the elders of the house went to him and raised him up from the ground, but he did not raise nor eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. And this is interesting. David's tone took a different turn at this point in time. And the servants David's were afraid to tell him because the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child is alive, he spoke to him and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. So the, his, the, his, um, the people around David were so concerned about David's state of health and state of mind, they were afraid he would harm himself. And that is also a very difficult place to be. And sometimes we end up in those very difficult places. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground Instead of harming himself, he got up from the ground, he washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes and went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. So instead of being angry through all this grief, he went to the Lord and worshiped him, knowing that God had still been merciful to him. Then he went to his own house and he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Then his fellow servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you rose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So David, even though he was had a lot of grief. He was still very rational in what he was doing here. Then David confronted Bathsheba, his wife. Her com- I'm sorry. <clears throat> then David comforted, not confronted. He comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to lie with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he went by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. And so we know that Solomon was a great king. He was one of the he was the wisest king of all the kings in Israel. So David also must wonder about these questions as he saw his world crumbling, the baby dead, his family in disarray and his future uncertain. And yet, despite the consequences of sin which had affected innocent people, which Uriah and the newborn baby, David also began to understand that God's grace would cover this, <clears throat> and someday the consequences of sin will be done away with. In the meantime, he could find rest for his troubled conscience with God's grace. And that's the hope that we have too, is that someday these consequences of sin will be burned in the, in the great lake of fire. But let's take a look at what David had to say in Psalms 51. Um, when he was opening his heart and confessing his sins to God. Um, We're going to look at 51, 1 through 6. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. So when we consider the cost of rest in Jesus, 
we need to first recognize that we need outside help. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We recognize our sin and cry out only one who can wash us, cleanse us, and renew us. When we do this, we take courage. Here is an adulterer. We see that in David, a manipulator, a murderer, and someone who at least violated five of the commandments, who called out for help, and God gave him complete and total forgiveness. All right. And we can have that complete and total forgiveness, and we're going to talk about that in our final thoughts. Uh, Wednesday, Scott, share with us something new. All right. So on Wednesday, um, we're going to look at how, so kind of what the causes are of, um, of David's sin and also how to overcome it and how to be like David and not like Herod. So that's kind of my outline. So l- let's look a little bit at the causes of what caused David to sin. Uh, and this is a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 717. It was the spirit of self-confidence and self-exaltation that prepared the way for David's fall. Flattery and the subtle allurements of power and luxury were not without effect upon him. Intercourse with the surrounding nations also exerted an influence for evil. According to the customs prevailing among Eastern rulers, crimes not to be tolerated in subjects were uncondemned in the king. The monarch was not under obligation to exercise the same self-restraint as the subject. All this tended to lessen David's sense of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And instead of relying in humility upon the power of Jehovah, he began to trust to his own wisdom and might. As soon as Satan can separate the soul from God, the only source of strength, he will seek to arouse unholy desires of man's carnal nature. The work of the enemy is not abrupt. It is not, at the outset, sudden and startling. It is a secret undermining of the strongholds of principle. It begins in apparently small things. The neglect to be true to God and to rely upon Him wholly, the disposition to follow the customs and practices of the world. And then it also talks about a change that occurred in David himself. He was broken in spirit by the consciousness of sin and its far-reaching results. He felt humbled in the eyes of his subjects. His influence was weakened. Hitherto, his prosperity had been attributed to his conscientious obedience to the commandments of the Lord. But now his subjects, having a knowledge of his sin, would be led to sin more freely His authority in his own household, his claim to respect and obedience from his sons was weakened. A sense of guilt kept him silent when he should have uh, condemned sin. It made his arm feeble to execute justice in his house. His evil example exerted its influence upon his sons, and God would not interpose to prevent the result. He would permit things to take their natural course, And thus, David was severely chastised. Um, And then it says, Even before his divine sentence was pronounced against David, he had begun to reap the fruit of transgression. His conscience was not at rest. And here comes that rest uh, motive that uh, his conscience was not at rest, so he couldn't feel secure as long as um, this, because of the sin that he had created. The agony of spirit which he endured is brought to view in the 32nd Psalm. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not the iniquity, and in whose spirit is no guile. So, um, we're, we're also going to contrast this so David, though, re- repented very fully and completely. And as, as Barbara read in the 51st Psalm, he, he was very repentant and he was willing to say, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. And I think she, you read up to six, so I'll continue from seven. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. 
make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice hide thy face from thy sins and blot out all my iniquities create a clean heart o god and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy holy spirit from me restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit then will i teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee um, deliver me from blood guiltiness o god thou god of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud thy righteousness now let's contrast kind of david's sincere request a uh, repentance with a uh, with another king who did not repent so so sincerely so during christ's life um we know we read about herod but not only did herod um through the instrumentalities of uh herodias behead john the baptist but then he went on to persecute christ and the apostles and he he wanted to have peter put to death but when god had peter uh saved by the angel then herod went ahead and killed the guards as though it was their fault um but he, here's what happens to herod and we'll read out of acts of the apostles and this is page 151 Herod knew that he deserved none of the praise and homage offered him that's after giving this speech yet he accepted the idolatry of the people as his due his heart bounded with triumph and a glow of gratified pride overspread his countenance as he heard the shout ascend it is the voice of a god and not a man but suddenly a terrible change came over him his face became pallid as death and distorted with agony great drops of sweat started from his pores he stood for a moment in terror then turning his blanched and livid face to a horror-stricken friend he cried in hollow despairing tones he whom you have exalted as a god is stricken with death suffering the most excruciating anguish he was born from the scene of revelry and display A moment before he had been the proud recipient of praise and worship of a vast throng now he realized that he was in the hands of a ruler mightier than himself remorse seized him he remembered his relentless persecution of the followers of Christ he remembered his cruel command to slay the innocent James and his design to put to death the apostle Peter he remembered how his mortification and his disappointed rage he had wreaked unreasoning vengeance upon the prison guards he felt that god was now dealing with him the relentless persecutor he found no relief from pain of body or anguish of mind as he ex- and he expected none It says herod was acquainted with the law of god thou shall have no other gods before me and he knew that accepting the worship of the people had filled up the measure of his iniquity and yet he brought upon himself the just wrath of jehovah the same angel who had come to the royal courts to rescue peter had been the messenger of wrath and judgment to herod the angel smote peter to arouse him from slumber and it was a different stroke that he smote the wicked king laying low his pride and bringing upon him the punishment of the almighty herod died in great agony of mind and body under the retributive judgments of god so contrasting that to david um i think david clearly even though he sinned he was willing to acknowledge his sin and to repent sincerely from it and God accepted his forgiveness and was able to create in him a new heart as evidenced by the fact that he he um continued to be helped and favored by God in his later days. We'll Thank you. There. Yeah. All right. Mark. Thanks Scott. Yeah, that was a that was a neat uh, contrast between David, like David and Herod. That was great. You know, one of the questions I'm going to say is that um as we we talk and we learn and study about David and his sin is that are we any better than David? 
I haven't committed murder, I don't think. <laughs> Not that I know of, I'm on camera. Uh, I haven't, you know, uh, I haven't done the same transgressions that, that David did. But of course, we know that. It's a rhetorical question, and the answer is, of course, we are no better than David. And let's read about Romans 3.22 that really kind of puts this out in clay, in, 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 and discusses how we all fall full, short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus to all and all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then we can go and, and read. Um, James is another uh, talking about the law and talking about stumbling. And let's read James chapter 2, verses 10. And this is pretty clear. Forever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble at one point, he is guilty of all. And that kind of comes out and says, okay, I haven't done the same thing David did, but I probably lied in my past. I've been dishonest. You know, um, I've been mean to others. Sin leads to another. Covetousness of another man's wife led yeah. to adultery. Adultery led to murder. Obviously, Murder yes. led to lying. Lying led to so on. <laughs> right. Once you start that spiral down. Yeah. Right. But I, the point is we're all sinners, right? So what do we do with this? What did David do with this? And it brings me to a point of what things we should do, and some of us should do pretty much every day, and that's exercise, actually. And there's, you know, and when you do exercise, you got to do a couple different things. You have to, you got to do cardiovascular exercise, and then they say you got to lift weights. Well, what does lifting weights mean? Well, lifting weights means that you actually are lifting something that will break down your muscles. And, you know, David, you probably know this better. Uh, Scott, you know this better than me, but it breaks down that muscle. But the, the human body is so awesome when you lift weights is that af if you let it heal after a little bit of time, it's going to grow back and be bigger and stronger than it was before. And what I'm going to say is that, you know, even though we sin in Jesus Christ for forgiveness, if we ask for forgiveness, if we come back to him, we can actually become greater in Christ. And we're going to read what David does um, in the second part of the Psalm 51. And uh, let's dig into this text. We're going to read through the whole thing, and then we'll, we'll decipher it at that point. So this is chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. Um, Psalms 51, 13 to 19. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me, from, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For it, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contract heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure design, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. See, so if I, you read in through this and decipher it, <clears throat> David realized he had sinned and sinned badly. But he clearly understands, if you decipher this, that, that even in this state, he can be something greater, even better than before. And you can see this first. You see this in Psalms 51 verse 14. And he clearly says, 51 verse 14 says, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness. Every one of us sinners, we can still sing aloud God's righteousness. Second one, we realize that in sin, if we are sincere with a broken spirit, broken spirit in our spirit, but really filled with God's spirit, then I would say the spirit of himself um, with a broken and contract heart, he can be a shining example of God. And let's read this in 51 verses 17. It clearly shows this right evidently. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contract heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. So after you have this, this, you know, we come to him with come to him with a broken heart for ourselves, for our, for our, for the stuff that we're trying to hold on to. But we're open to the Lord. In nineteen, 
God shows in, in Psalms 51 verses 19, God will then be pleased with his sacrifice. And you can see what he says there. He says, then you'll be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. So we know this. Now, one of the things I was in John, we, if we go to the New Testament and we read John, uh, 1 John 1 through 9, it really sums up the second half of Psalms 51, uh, 13 through uh, 19 very well. And it says, if we confess our, confess our sins, he is faithful, God, and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're, not, if we're not unrighteous, we're righteous. Ellen White says it really awesomely in Steps of Christ. He says, Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, dependent. I mean, I'm going to rephrase a little bit. He doesn't want us to wait. He doesn't, God wants us to come right away. We may come, and Ellen, this is Ellen White again, we may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and walk in his feet in penitence. And it is his glory to encircle us from all impurity. Steps to Christ, pages 50. You know, David's experience, experienced the cleansing power of, God, of Christ's forgiveness. His relationship with God was restored. His spirit was renewed. Yes, he had consequences, but his spirit was renewed. He once again entered the life of service for the God, for the Christ that loved him and forgave him. You know, and, you know, and I think that, um, and, and cleansed him and transformed him. Okay. And that's, that's uh, Thursday for us, a renewed spirit. Okay. Do you have a final thought? Yeah. So I, a couple final thoughts is that, you know, <laughs> you know, whether we are coming to someone and talking and reporting a sin like the prophet Nathan did, or we're going to be like David that needs to really admit our sins. One of the things I learned from this lesson is we have to do it with God, whether it's prayer, whether it's, you know, bringing him into our hearts. That's so, so evident here. The other, the other thing I want to say is that even though we do these mistakes, every one of us will make mistakes God shows us is that he can make us still always make us shining examples to others. That's the amazing thing about God's grace and his amazing love to us. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. Scott, did you have a couple things you wanted to say? So I'll just conclude with saying that when, um, when we sin, we no longer have God's rest with us. So I think that can create a lot of problems, including many different mental illnesses. So I think the way to avoid that is to ask God for forgiveness. But I think in the process of asking God for forgiveness, we also have to be willing to forgive ourselves. Um, I think mm. when, when Christ says to forgive your enemies, it's not purely for your enemy's sake. It's also for, for your own sake. And sometimes we can be our own enemies so that's, that's one thought that kind of came to me is like when, when God is for asking us to forgive our enemies, he's actually among other people asking us to forgive ourselves because we can be our own enemies. So I'll just conclude with um, if you do sin, get forgiveness from God and then also forgive yourself because uh, only that way can you move on to live a better life. Thank you. And um, the final thought that I have comes to us from Patriarchs and Prophets. It's paraphrased in Friday's lesson, but I would like us to take a look at the longer version of this paraphrase. So we're going to look at Patriarchs and Prophets 725 and 726, and we're going to take excerpts from that. David's repentance was sincere and deep. There was no effort to palliate his crime. No desire to escape the judgments threatened his inspired prayer, but he saw the enormity of his transgression against God. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. And loathing, that, that means he really disliked his sin. It was not for pardon that he prayed, but for a purity of heart. David did not despair David did not in despair give over the struggle. In the promise of God to repentant sinners, he saw the evidence of his pardon and acceptance. 
For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So David realized that what God really wanted. It wasn't about sacrifices. It wasn't about offerings. It was about a true heart for him. Though David had fallen, the Lord lifted him up. He was now more fully in harmony with God and in sympathy with his fellow men than before he fell. In the joy of his release, see his joy from that, in, that, in that rest, he sang, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgettest the iniquity of my sin. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance, he says in Psalms 32. And we know that David understood that. He had fought many a battle with the Lord, and God had continued to preserve him. Many have murmured at what they call God's justice in sparing David, whose guilt was so great after having rejected Saul for what appeared to be a far less flagrant sin. But David humbled himself and confessed his sin, while Saul despised reproof and hardened his heart in impenitence. Thousands of the children of God who have been betrayed into sin, when ready to give up to despair, have remembered how David's sincere repentance and confession were accepted by God. Notwithstanding, he suffered his trans. For his transgression, and they also have taken courage to repent and try to again walk in the way of God's commandments. Whoever under reproof of God will humble the soul with confession and repentance, as David did, will be sure that there is hope for him. Whoever will in faith accept God's promises will find pardon. The Lord will never cast away one truly repentant soul. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful for, for these um, remembrances that you have given us about King David, Lord. We pray that we learn from his life. We pray, Lord, that we will truly give to you a contrite heart. And we ask, and I know I'm praying for everyone who's listening today, Lord, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. So as we go through this week, Lord, we want to walk with you. We want to walk with you uprightly and in honor. We want to um, know that that, um, walking with you in your commandments and in your way is better than sacrifice and offerings. So, Lord, we pray that we can be with you this week, that we will lift you up and uphold you, and you will help us to walk uprightly in all ways. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Have a good rest of your week.